Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for our webinar, Illuminate Spectroscopy. I'm just going to go over a few things uh, real quick before I pass it on to your presenters, Melissa and Noose. Um, just to let you know that we are recording this webinar and it will be available on our website uh, in the next day or so. Uh, I'll be putting the link to that um, in the chat where you can find that later. I'm also going to put a link to a folder with a lot of uh, uh, resources for today's webinar. Um, we have the slide deck in there and some other things around the experiments that we'll be going over and I'll put that in the chat as well. Um, and we'd love to answer your questions. So feel free to use the Q&A or the chat feature and we'll be monitoring that. And if we happen to not get to your question, we will follow up with you um, after the webinar today. So. With that, I will pass it on to your presenters, Melissa and Luce. Yeah, thanks, Angie. Um, I am Dr. Melissa Hill, and I'm here with Noose Hissam. We're both chemists at uh, Vernier Software and Technology here, and I'll I'll let Noose say hi and introduce himself a little bit. Hi, my name is Noose Hissam. I taught chemistry and physics in Maryland for 34 years and used uh, Vernier equipment for most of that time since the early 80s. Um, and now I, in, the, in the past five years, I've been working at the office here in the chemistry group um, in Portland, and I'm having a, I'm having a blast. Uh, yeah, and um, kind of like news, all the scientists actually here at Vernier are all former teachers. So I, I started out my career teaching at the college level um gen chem spectroscopy stuff like that um and then i've been at vernier now for 11 years and we wear lots of hats here we do not only this kind of technical support and, and faculty training but um we also develop the products and uh, help with the curriculum and help with the software so it, it's a pretty small company we get to to wear a lot of hats, which is really fun. So we're, Noose and I are both having a great time <laughs> at the company. Um, the only other chemist we have at Vernier is Elaine Nam. She's the third one of us. And uh, if you call and have chemistry questions, you're gonna get one of us. So it's kind of good to put the name with the face every once in a while. Um, all right, so I'm just gonna go over a couple more things that Angie said. Uh, if you have any questions, Please, 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 please put them into chat. You can use the Q&A as well, it's available. Um, I really don't like just lecturing and, and talking to the, the internet. Um, so let's try and make this as interactive as possible. Let us know you're here. Let us know what you want today. If you have any questions, burning questions that you really wanna get out of today's webinar, throw those in chat right now. Tell us where you're from. Tell us if you love Vernier, if you're not, if you don't know anything about it. Um, we'd love to hear all that. Uh, Noose and Angie are gonna be monitoring the chat mostly, but uh, Noose will definitely interrupt me if something comes up and uh, we need to address it right away. Uh, like I said, we're former teachers. Anytime you go to a workshop, you want free stuff. Uh, so we're trying to, to do that even in this virtual world. Um, most of the free stuff you're going to get is in this uh, Google folder here that um, Angie just put into the chat. There's a ton of stuff in there. We're going to go over a ton of stuff today, um, but definitely check it out. There's um, lab instructions, lab files, videos all in there. So definitely take, take a look at that. Um, you're also going to get, uh, we're going to talk about data sharing and graphical analysis pro again to kind of make this an interactive thing with you all here today. Um, so you'll be getting a, a code for a 12 day free trial of graphical analysis pro and just like Angie said, you will be getting a recording of this workshop emailed to you in a few days you'll also be getting that precious PD certificate. Um, emailed to you. So if you have any questions around that, definitely throw them in the chat, but that'll all be coming your way. All right, so why are we here today to illuminate spectroscopy? Um, I'm sure uh, most of you, if you're one of your customers, have one of these two spectrometers. Uh, there's the SpectraVis Plus that we sold for probably over 10 years. Um, and then a couple of years ago, we replaced it with the GoDirect SpectraVis Plus. These are 
almost identical spectrometers. The difference is this one has built in Bluetooth, so you can take data on a phone or a tablet. But other than that, they are interchangeable in a classroom. Um, you can do all the same experiments you've been doing with this one. Um, you can plug it into all the same computers, lab quests, etc. So I'm going to be using this one a lot today, but um, you, you uh, may have this one at home. And you can use it with everything we're talking about today. But um, you probably pull these out once a year for your Beer's Law experiments. And that's great. We love Beer's Law. We're, we're all chemists here. Beer's Law is bread and butter to us. But we actually talk about spectroscopy the entire first year of chemistry. You really talk about it in every chemistry level you ever have because spectroscopy is such a powerful tool for teaching the fundamentals of chemistry. Um, so they're not just for Beer's Law, your spectrometers, because you're teaching spectroscopy throughout the year. So there's a ton of other hands-on activities that you can have your students doing with these that isn't just Beer's Law. Stuff for teaching atomic theory that you've probably already finished in uh, this, this semester, um, or electron structure, periodic table trends, and then when you get into stoichiometry and mole theory and molarity, you know, you don't have to wait till then to pull them out. So we're going to give you some activities today that um, you can pull them out throughout the whole year and give your students more hands on activities because that's that's our goal here at Vernier. The more hands on, the better. Um, so some of the topics we're going to cover that you can use these spectrometers for um, is that really that beginning, gosh, that first week of gen chem where you're bringing up the electromagnetic spectrum you're talking about what is light yeah we see white light in our classroom and and we see light on our phones but what actually is that what is it composed of it it has numbers associated with it what does that all mean um so we're going to talk about some practical applications for getting your students involved and engaged with that and then to build on to that, when we get into atomic theory and stuff like that, we're going to say, how can we use that light that we just talked about and learned about to tell us about atoms and atomic structure and electron mobility um, and the fact that energy is quantized and what energy actually is and talk about some thermodynamics. Um, so all that's in all that atomic section that you talk about that you might be in the middle of right now or you might have already finished. Um, but then you can even build on that, that tried and true, how can light tell us about molecules? Well, it can give us lots of information about the concentration and the identity of those molecules with Beer's Law. So that's kind of uh, the summary of what we're going to go over today. And um, let's talk about the tools we're going to use. So again, one of these spectrometers, SpectraVis Plus or GoDirect SpectraVis Plus. Um, with the two different spectrometers, there are unfortunately two different optical fibers. Um, so you need to keep them track. You need to keep track of them. Uh, we are going to be using the optical fiber a lot today. So it's important to know if you have this SpectraVis Plus, kind of the older version that's no longer sold. You want the fiber optic cable that has the little yellow tip at the end of it. Um, this is an older fiber optic cable. We still sell it in case you've broken yours or you don't have it. But if you have a Go Direct SpectraVis Plus, you want the one with the little red tip. And there's a couple reasons for this. One, the red tipped one is also keyed. So it's actually, um, you know, for safety reasons that we had to switch to the keyed version. Um, but we also changed the light path in the go direct so that you don't have to use as much volume for your absorbent samples, your Beer's Law. That was really important to a lot of our customers. So that's why there's two different fibers. Um, so make sure you're using the right one. Again, we're always here for you. If you have questions, please contact us. We want you to be using the right tools. All right, next up, we're going to be using a lab quest. So Lots of you may have LabQuest 2s, kind of similar story. We sold these for a really long time. Then they were replaced recently by these LabQuest 3s. Both of these will work for everything we're going to talk about today. Both of these will work with both spectrometers. It's pretty interchangeable. Um, all the 
menus are the same. How you plug stuff in is, is pretty similar. So um, you're, I'm going to be using this one most of the time, but you could have your LabQuest 2 out just the same. But if you have any questions about that, just throw them into chat. Let us know. OK, then I'm going to be using a software called LabQuest Viewer Software so you guys can see the LabQuest screen and see how I'm tapping. It's a really powerful teaching tool. You might already have one, this software. It's um, a site license. It's great for projecting your LabQuest screen and, and having students follow along as they tap. Then we're going to transfer data from LabQuest to graphical analysis. So um, graphical analysis is a um, awesome tool that we can use to share data to all our students live. And um, so in order to have some interactive stuff a little bit later, I it would be great if you had that free version of graphical analysis on your computer or your phone, whatever you want to follow along with, go to vernier.com backslash GA and download it right now for free. Because then, like I said, we're going to give you a code to up, update that to GA Pro. And then we're going to do some interactive data sharing, and you're going to get to see all the data that I'm demoing uh, live on your own device. Uh, and lastly, I'm going to talk, uh, show you guys spectral analysis, which is our free piece of software for you specifically with spectrometers. So we're going to go over a lot of stuff. Um, you don't need all these tools, um, but you'll see how all of them are, are incorporated and what you can use with what you already have. All right, so let's first get started with the question of what is light and giving our students some practical applications for learning about the electromagnetic spectrum. Now you're probably really good at showing this electromagnetic spectrum and um, displaying that for your students. You may even be able to pull out some of these little um, diffraction gratings and hold them up to your, your uh, lights in your classroom and students can get those those pretty colors that they see through the diffraction grading. Well, why not make that exercise and those lights that come up uh, quantitative? Why not actually put some numbers behind it, take some measurements and get your students a little bit more involved with the science behind it? So to do that, I'm going to plug in my GoDirect SpectraVis Plus. Okay, via USB to my LabQuest 3. All right. And it just goes straight to USB in the LabQuest 3. Oops, press some buttons. All right, and now I'm going to pull up LabQuest Viewer, that software I told you. Um, that just displays the LabQuest screen. So when I plug in a spectrometer, uh, it defaults to absorbance mode. I'm going to be looking at spectra of different light bulbs, and I want to look at the emission spec. So I need to change the mode of data collection to intensity. To do that, I click on this big red box and click on spectrometer mode and change it to intensity. And now it's ready to measure from the fiber optic cable that I slide into the cuvette slot here. So now there's a fiber optic in there. And um, so the light block, the light path is blocked and I'm going straight to the detector. I have the other end of it clamped down here um, in just a, a normal clamp. Make sure it kind of stays in one place. And then I have my light bulb clamped in another one. And so we're just going to change out light bulbs. Kids are very familiar with white light and light bulbs. They maybe even are aware of the evolution of light bulbs in the commercial market. Um, and you can talk a lot about the different composites of these light bulbs and how that contributes to the changing marketplace. Um, so something really, so let's go ahead and get some data and explore a little bit more about that. First off, light bulbs are really, really bright. So I don't want to collect that much light. So I'm going to turn down the amount of time that the spectrometer is taking light. 
And then I'm going to collect some data. My light bulb is not on, so it should be a flat line, which it is. All right, prepare your eyes. I'm going to turn on this light bulb. I guess I should say I should prepare my eyes. <laughs> the screen just brightens for you guys. And now you get this nice peak, right? This is white light. It contains lots of colors of the rainbows. I'm gonna stop that. Just like that, um, just like this visible light uh, and electromagnetic spectrum that you show them, this, all this white light um, has all these colors in it. And so you can see that here, that it appears light to our eyeballs um, but actually, this is containing all the different colors. Hey, Melissa, um, can you turn on the background spectrum? I can. So what I how in a lab quest to turn on the little strip, I have to go into graph, show graph, show spectrum, and then you can do it as a full graph or a narrow strip. I'm going to do a, a narrow strip and it pulls it at the top and then it shows me all the colors that are contained in this. So that's a really helpful thing to do as well. Um, sometimes the I find the full graph to be a little overwhelming, but I know a lot of people really like this so we'll so we'll leave it up. Okay, next I'm going to switch from this incandescent bulb to a CFA fluorescent bulb here. And, um, you know, a lot of these have warnings on them. Uh, they're trying to not sell them as much anymore. You can't throw them away with normal uh, garbage um, because they contain mercury. And if you're gonna build on these concepts with talking about atoms, you can take a spectrum of this guy and see the difference between this bulb and the incandescent bulb really quickly. And one of those is that very pronounced 550 mercury peak. So let me go ahead and turn that off. Um, and if you wanna compare the two, oh goodness, I have forgotten to label my runs. Well, that's gonna get really confusing really fast. So let me go back to run one and make sure I label it incandescent bulb. To do that, I go over to my table screen and I want to change run one first. Double click on this title up here, run one, and call it incandescent bulb. So done. And now I'm going to switch to run two. And that is my CFA bulb. Done. Go back to my graph. And I want to look at both. So I'm going to say all runs. And you can see like that bulb still appears white to my eye. It still has some intensity throughout the whole spectrum, but it just like the incandescent, but it's really swamped by these peaks because this, you know, some of these elements that are in here are contributing to the longer life and the lower energy requirements and all that kind of stuff. But one of them, this one over here is actually mercury. So that's why you, you have to dispose of them safely. And if they break, that's, that's not good. All right, and one more bulb that I wanna go into, and of course you could do this with as many bulbs as you can find. You can do this with LEDs um, to really drive home the different colors in a spectrum. But I love looking at this grow lamp, especially because when you're teaching you know, first year chemistry, a lot of your students maybe care, they're just coming out of biology or they wanna go to medical school. You know, They're really biology oriented. So I like this grow lamp. Uh, that our biologists use to help grow their uh, algae and their plants in the in the lab and um, and see this one's actually more of like a pinkish purple color it's not a white light color and if you look it's actually really strong so those peaks are getting a little swamped so I'm going to physically move my fiber and physically move my lamp away so we can get a little bit more definition in that peak. There we go, now we see the tops of those peaks. Um, and I have a hard time seeing these peaks through the full spectrum. So that's why I like the narrow strip a little bit better. There we go. So this one just contains two broad peaks and those are actually where chlorophyll and other plant pigments absorb light. So um, 
you can actually talk to students about how that helps, you know, in a biological stance. So it's a very practical application of students relating light and making it more uh, quantifiable. So now I have some beautiful data that I want to make sure you all have. And in order to do that, because unless you have, you know, 30 spectrometers and 30 lab quests and 30 light bulb setups, chances are you're either having your students work in groups and you want them to share data, or maybe you're even doing this just as a demo and then you want to have some interactive conversation with your students about it. Um, first off, you can just collect the data just like we did, save it and send it to your students. That's always an option. You can do that in LabQuest like we just did. You can do it in our tried and true Logger Pro program. Um, if you have a site license for this, this works with all our spectrometers. You can do it in that. You can also do it in our new free software called Spectral Analysis. But if you want to do something with live data sharing and um, kind of a more interactive conversation, we need to transfer the data into graphical analysis so that I can share it with all of my students. And in today's case, I'm going to share it with all of you. So there's a few steps involved to do this. And um, you guys are seeing my LabQuest screen, so you'll know exactly how I set up all this. But first, I need to get data from uh, LabQuest to graphical analysis. Um, so I can data share locally from my LabQuest here to graphical analysis on my computer. And um, first, I'm going to give you all your code for GA Pro. So open up your graphical analysis screen, your free version. And then in the bottom corner here, it says activate additional features with your license key. And Noose, yep, put that license key right into chat. So feel free to copy and paste um, directly and then hit uh, that submit button. That is the number zero in there. So it's lowercase y, uppercase L, lowercase x, lowercase h, the number zero, lowercase y, dash capital Y, and the number three. And that'll give you free graphical analysis pro for the next 12 days, it even tells you how when that expires. Um, so definitely take advantage of that. And so now that I've enabled that, I'm going to get the data off of my lab quest by clicking on that data sharing button. And by default, it comes up with online. We're going to talk about that in a minute. We don't need that right now. We want local because we're on the same network. We're in the same room. I want to get it from my local environment, my local LabQuest 3. My LabQuest 3 has not been uh, projecting its signal very well, so it didn't show up under Discover Devices. But I figured this was fine because I can show you all how to troubleshoot. Um, when it doesn't show up on your discovered devices, you can click on the specify source and click and type in the IP address of your lab quest. And so I have the IP address right here on my lab quest. I'm just going to type that in. Press connect. And now I have all the data that I just collected and I can turn on my legend. And you can see all my data there. Oh, I never named my run three, but that was my grow lamp. Um, and so now I want all of you to have this data, right? So as the teacher, I want to share it to you all. So you all, as the students, your screen, you've already enabled GA Pro. So leave, leave your screen here or go back to this screen from a file new experiment. And um, I, as the teacher, I'm gonna start the data sharing session by clicking on this TIE Fighter icon. And then I'm gonna say start, say start session. And I'm gonna get a code. Let's, mm, yep, okay. And this is the code that now the students enter in their version of data share. So I have my phone over here that's kind of projecting click on that same data sharing button and you want the online tab and this is the source ID. So it's O A R the number one D V. All right. 
And so there's all my data that came in through on my phone. I'm gonna turn it, make sure the data looks pretty. Yeah, there we go. So hopefully you all are seeing this too and you're getting this data. And now you can have it, you can save it, you can uh, do more analysis, you can look at the exact peaks, you can overlap it with a mercury spectrum. I put some mercury spectra in the Google folder. Um, just have fun with it and, and save it for later. But that's how you can data share um, to your students with a demo in the class or your students can share data with each other. It's pretty cool. Um, all right. I won't need this anymore. And I'm gonna go ahead and end the data sharing. Oh, some people are still trying to connect. I'll leave it there. Um, but in the meantime, we're gonna go, go on. Um, the, all the instructions, I know what we just went through was a lot of steps. All that is in the slide deck here. And I also put it in a separate Google Doc. Um, so feel free to, to go through that. Once you get the hang of it, it goes pretty quick. Um, all right. And so now you've talked to your students a lot about light and what it means and how it has different colors in it. And now you wanna talk about how that light can be used to tell us about atoms. And you talk about atomic theory and electron movement, all that kind of great stuff. A great way to do that is with a flame test. And I'm sure many of you are already doing this because it's just super cool to put um, stuff in, uh, in fire and see it change color. So you can see Noose did an excellent video of this. We actually did an entire PD workshop on it. Um, last fall. So go look in the archives of our webinars and you'll see it. Um, but that lithium chloride he put in there and that makes that flame a beautiful color. Students, ooh and ah, that's super exciting. Um, but why not make it quantitative? Why not actually get some peaks from it and, and make it an actual you know, experiment with hands-on stuff? So you can do that with the same setup you have here with the same fiber optic cable, the same spectrometer. You can do it with LabQuest or spectral analysis. And um, one word of caution, you do wanna make sure that fiber optic is not too close to that flame. Notice Noose has a pretty good distance there uh, because that fiber optic is plastic and it will melt. <laughs> so be careful with that. Um, but you can run through a bunch of different salts and get their spectra. I put some of those spectra in that Google folder. And then you give your students a mixture and have them determine what's in that mixture. So this is very applicable to what's going, uh, what, what real chemistry technicians will do in like a forensics lab or in a research science lab um, to determine what metals are in an unknown compound. And, um, it's a really powerful way to use light to talk about atoms and identifying them. You can also take these exact wavelengths that these metals are coming out with and um, calculate their energies. And you can talk about periodic table trends because that's where we get a lot of that information. So a great way to kind of elaborate on a flame test and just the ooh and ah of pretty colors. All right, another thing we talk about a lot with atomic theory is um, Planck and Planck's constant and the photoelectric effect and quantized energy. The One of the best ways I know to demonstrate this is with fluorescence spectroscopy. And a lot of people who have SpectraVis Plus don't realize that it does fluorescence or if they know it does fluorescence, they don't know what to do with it. Um, so we're going to show you uh, some really easy chemicals to get your hands on that can show this fluorescence capability and talk to your students about how energy is quantized. So for that, I, I don't need the fiber optic anymore. I'm going to put that off to the side. I'm also going to disconnect it from my lab quest because I want to show you spectral analysis. So I'm going to um, close my session of GA. 
And I'm gonna plug my spectrometer into my computer here via USB, doesn't need an interface or anything like that. Just goes directly into the USB port of your computer. Um, and then I'm gonna open spectral analysis. And if you haven't used spectral analysis a lot, if you're more familiar with LabQuest or Logger Pro, come on, here we go. Um, this may look very different for you. Um, we actually developed a spectral analysis very specifically for use with spectrometers because Logger Pro and LabQuest really weren't that user friendly. You have to go into like a weird setting to change it to Beer's Law and stuff like that. So we kind of um, made an app just for doing spectroscopy work um, to make it a lot more user friendly. Um, so you can see right away, you can see all the different modes of data collection that are available to you with the SpectraVis Plus. I wanna look at absorbance and fluorescence back to back so I can calculate those energies and talk to my students about how energy is quantized. So for that, I need advanced full spectrum. And I'm gonna start out in absorbance mode, which does require calibration. So I'm gonna click calibrate and I'm gonna go into this calibrate screen. Now, a lot of people get, they wanna press the skip button as soon as possible when they get to this screen. Um, they just think, oh, I've had my lamp on all day long. It's been there for every single class. Well, I'll tell you, that's really not true. Anytime you click that calibrate button, it turns the lamp off. And then when it's on the screen is really the only time it's getting warm up. So when we talk to customers who are um, you know, concerned about baselines not being flat or accuracy not being as good as they want it to be or a lot of noise, what I really recommend is when your students immediately when they come to class, have them plug in the spectrometer and open the piece of software that they're using and get to this screen because you know the lamp will not turn off after this screen and then do your pre-lab lecture to have your students do their Beer's Law um, solutions because then the lamp will be warmed up really nice and you'll get a really nice flat line. All right, so to calibrate, I wanna make sure I use water. And I'm gonna finish my calibration. And I'm gonna collect an absorbance spectrum. I get a nice flat line. And now I'm gonna do uh, some fluorescein. And this is a really easy chemical to get from Flynn Scientific if you use them. Um, and then you can just dissolve it in water. Usually you wanna put a little bit of ethanol in there. Um, and this is its absorbance spectrum. So it has, it's, it's not a great absorber, obviously. It's really, really low. This is kind of a, a crummy spectrum by all absorbance standards. But that's because its power is in fluorescence. Um, so you can, you can use that as well to, to discuss absorbance versus fluorescence. But um, we're here to talk about energy quantization. So we're going to now take a fluorescence spectrum. So I can just click on my settings, click over to fluorescence. And with the SpectraVis Plus, you get two excitation wavelengths. And you change them down here. You can have 405 or 500 nanometers. You pick this value based on which one it absorbs more light at, because then you'll get a stronger fluorescence peak. So I'm gonna use 500 nanometers for fluorescein. Press collect fluorescence, and I get a nice big peak. So let me pull this down. And you'll notice um, my fluorescence came up on my double Y axis, so this peak, if I didn't have a double y-axis of 0.5, where my absorbance was 0.07, you know, would have completely swamped the scale, and this would have looked like a flat line, and this would have looked like a big old peak. So that's why we have it on a double y-axis. It's actually super helpful, um, but it does, it, it can confuse people sometimes. Um, great. So now we want to look at the peak of this absorbance, and I can use statistics for that. I can click around. But what I'm really interested in is the wavelength, right? I want to I want to select the wavelength that I got a, the highest absorbance. 
And the wavelength that I got the highest fluorescence, I want to zoom in on this so I can get it a little bit better. And I have to kind of rescale it because there was a weird peak there. Um, and I can look at the two wavelengths and I can talk to my students about what's really happening in this cuvette. And wow, look at that. It's all, you can kind of see the color, maybe not. And when you're in real life, it actually glows green, which is really, really cool for students to see. Um, but you actually talk to them about what's happening. Say absorbance is just, you know, the light that it's absorbing and you're putting it from a ground state into an excited state. And now because fluorescein has this special um, chemistry behind it, when it goes, when it goes, when it relaxes from its excited state, it actually emits light. And that's a characteristic of this molecule. Um, and you can convert these wavelengths to energy and you can talk about using Planck's constant and you can talk about this difference. And then you can say, well, what, why is there a difference here? Where did, where did this energy go? And a lot of students will jump to heat, right? Because heat is what we always say, when, when energy is lost, that, that's heat. Um, but the definition of heat is, is uh, very specific. And that can bring up a whole discussion about thermodynamics, because if I pull out that cuvette right now, it's not gonna be hot. So um, you can talk about thermodynamics there, you can talk about energies, and you can talk about all those different energy levels. Um, and that's a great hands-on way that gets students engaged with quantized energy and atomic theory. Um, so another great molecule you can use to look at the quantization of energy is chlorophyll. Um, and I don't have, I didn't buy chlorophyll. I just put some extra virgin olive oil in a cuvette and did this exact same thing that I just did for fluorescein with extra virgin olive oil. Um, and I personally, when I was teaching, I loved bringing things back from weeks and months before. And we just talked about this grow light and how it had very specific peaks that were uh, tailored for chlorophyll. I can overlap those with my spectra in that same advanced um, full spectrum mode we just went through in SA. And you can see right here, this grow lamp overlaps perfectly with this chlorophyll spectrum. Um, so that really brings it back to like, you know, look at what we learned about light and how that interacts with, with atoms and molecules. And then you can look at the absorbance and fluorescence of this peak, which I've kind of zoomed in on and also talk about that. And that gets your students, one, it's an even easier chemical to get a hold of, but also your students kind of know a little bit more about chlor chlorophyll. They've been through, through biology and they've seen some of that. All right, so that got us all the way to talking about atoms and energy. And now we're gonna talk about molecules. And before we get into Beer's Law, cause I'm sure everyone here has done Beer's Law a lot. Um, Noose actually came up with some great kind of qualitative hands-on experiments that he did with his students uh, to talk about the absorbance and transmission of light. So I'm gonna share that with you today. And you don't need a spectrometer for it. So I'm gonna unplug this, but um, I need something to hold up my clip, my very fancy clipboard with paper on it. Um, so I'm just gonna set that there to hold it. But when you wanna just talk about the um, transmission and absorbance of light, you bring up the color wheel, right? And um, you talk about complementary colors and which one absorbs and which one um, transmits light. Um, and a great way to demonstrate that just in, in your classroom really easily, you don't need any sensors or spectrometers, is with these colored, these are just food coloring and water solutions and some different colored laser pointers. So you look at that color wheel and you say, hey, I have a I have a green laser pointer. So hopefully everyone can, can see that. You have a green laser pointer. Let me move this over a little bit more so you guys can see what's coming up on the screen. Okay, there's your green laser pointer. And so if I put a green solution in front of green light, all of that should be transmitted, right? Because it's not gonna absorb it or maybe your students think it will. 
and you'd say, well, what happens? It all that green light went through, none of that got absorbed. But it's complementary color on the color wheel there is red. So red should absorb all that green light, right? And there's that green LED, put that red light in and all that light's gone. So that's a really cool way to demonstrate the difference between absorbance and transmittance and why if I put a green solution in my spectrometer, I do not get a peak at green in absorbance mode, I get a peak in the red. Um, so you can do that with different uh, laser pointers and different food coloring solutions. Noose, tell us about what your kids liked about this and, and how it worked in your classroom. The way I did this was um, I used, I set those up just the way Melissa has it there. And I had a three by five card instead of having a screen set up. And what the kids would do is they would shine the laser down through the whole, the whole array at the same time and drop the three by five card between. And so what you ended up getting was by doing that is some combination of yellow and red, yellow and blue or yellow and red. And the kids could follow the beam you know, through the different colors. Um, if you drop just a teeny bit of um, coffee uh, creamer in there, you can get a little bit of particles floating so that you can get some, get some, um, some light that's, you know, that's sent out in different directions. It's reflected off those particles. It's kind of like a laser light show, right? So the kids can see the beam as it's passing through the solution or not. Um, and so that I left that set up and, you know, about on penalty of death, they were not allowed to shine those lasers at anything but the food color solutions. Uh, but most cases, they were pretty good at, at uh, doing that. And I found a lot of kids that would just stand there and try the different colors and just think about, you know, what's going on. And that's exactly what I was hoping they would do. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, it's a lot of fun to, to shine these lights at the different colored solutions and kind of really think about what's going on, because then if you shine it at blue or yellow, you'll get different amounts of transmission and, and just thinking about that before you give them a spectrometer that um, is actually measuring those in a more quantitative way. It's always nice for kids to just see it in a, in a big picture kind of sense and what's really happening. Um, so now to get into Beer's Law, and we actually did a full webinar on this uh, again last fall on absorbance and percent transmittance. Um, you start off, so if you're in AP uh, chemistry, you're starting off with sports drinks and you really need students to go back and forth between um, measuring percent transmittance and then getting the absorbance um relationship and them understanding that that even coming up with it for themselves uh, if you're not an ap you're probably going straight to absorbance and just talking about the different concentrations um, you can you look at uh, different levels of colored solutions and the different molarity as it changes um, in kind of a qualitative way but then also in a quantitative way with the spectrometer doing beer's law so I highly recommend checking out that webinar. Um, I did put the videos and the experiment files all in your Google folder. So you can check all that stuff out. Um, and then if you have any questions about it, definitely let us know. Um, and yeah, so this is uh, some of the student files and teacher files that are in your folder. But looking at Beer's Law, you change the concentration. What is that relationship? I am given an unknown. I need to determine the molarity. So using light to actually learn things about molecules and the concentration and how you can identify molecules with the molar absorptivity and then how you can identify the concentration of that sample. So again, you know, light is very powerful. It tells us a lot of, a lot of cool stuff about chemistry. Uh, and that food dye experiment that you start out with in AP Chem and looking at percent transmittance. And you may even wanna do this with your non-AP kids because you know, again, talking about the relationship between transmittance and absorbance 
is um, a little bit easier. It makes it an easier sell when you get to Beer's Law and absorbance mode if they've already understood the relationship between tr percent transmittance and absorbance, which is why um, you know they have you do it in AP. So it's a good way to get your students started, um, just like we did with the food coloring and the laser pointer, talking about percent T and, and absorbance. Um, all right, so we've talked about all the different ways that we can use light to talk to students just about what is light, how we can talk about atomic theory and electron movement with that and energies, and then how we can talk about um, learn stuff about molecules. So all that all those experiment files that I generated and shared with you are also shared in a hard copy in that Google folder. So that's a free resource we're giving to you today. Um, but Vernier in general has lots of free resources for teachers to, to help them get you know, more hands-on activities in their classrooms. Our website is a wealth of knowledge. Um, we've been doing these webinars now since kind of the beginning of pandemic, so we have quite the webinar library on our website. I highly recommend checking it out. There's physics, there's earth science, there's biology, um, and then a bunch of chemistry ones that uh, Noose and Elaine and I have all done. Uh, so check those out. They have great information. There's also a video library on our website that if you don't want to sit through a whole hour uh, of a recorded webinar, um, you can look at some brief videos on how to set up your spectrometer or doing Beer's Law with your colorimeter or setting up your polarimeter, calibrating your pH probe. There's lots of videos about all those different types of stuff, so I highly recommend checking those out. And we do still offer a free uh, Vernier experiment and sample data library. So this has um, free sample data that was collected by all the scientists here, free experimental write-ups from our books and free videos. That'll be available till the end of the school year. Um, and then our software and uh, making sure students have the right software, something we always wanna talk about. If you already have a site license for Logger Pro, know that that allows you to distribute to all of your students and all of your teachers in your department. Um, so that site license is very powerful and you use your Vernier account on our website to log in and get access to Logger Pro and then you can send it to your students that way. So we definitely wanna make sure you're taking advantage of that. It doesn't need to be on just 10 computers or something like that. You don't need a license key. You log into your Vernier account and distribute it to students that way. Uh, that's only Mac and Windows. It doesn't work on Chromebooks. If you have Chromebooks or iPads or Android tablets, you need graphical analysis. All your wired sensors will work with graphical analysis. Um, that's a free download from our website. You saw how that works today. Um, and we gave you that free 12-day uh, code for Graphical Analysis Pro. We also offer a 30-day trial of Graphical Analysis Pro. So if you get to the end of your 12 days and you still want to do a 30-day one, sign up for that on our website. The 12-day one doesn't count against you at all. Um, and then if you have our spectrometers, you'll definitely need spectral analysis as a free download to use iOS and Android. Okay. Um, and I already talked a little bit about graphical analysis and graphical analysis pro. Yep, don't forget that 12 day code, write it down if you didn't join in with the interactive portion, um, but make sure you have it so you can use it. Um, some different features between graphical analysis and graphical analysis pro. Um, people might see, well, why, why should I upgrade um, when I have the free version? The data sharing that we showed today is very specific for Graphical Analysis Pro. You absolutely need um, Graphical Analysis Pro to do that. But data sharing from just a lab quest that I did in the very beginning um, to Graphical Analysis, you do not need the pro version for that. That is included in the free version. Um, some other things, we have built-in videos in Graphical Analysis Pro that you can do analysis with. You can export as a PDF in Graphical Analysis Pro. Uh, you can also do basic and custom curve fits. 
So those are kind of the big things for chemists in particular. Physics people have a, a whole wealth of other things that are open to them. Um, but chem and bio, those are those are the big the big things that GA Pro allows us to have. And um, that's pretty much what we wanted to talk about today. News? Did any uh, good questions come up or anything I missed? What should I? What What else should we talk about? I mean, I think I hit most of them. There was some question about what other what other um, colored solutions do we have experiments for, and we discussed copper sulfate and nickel nitro, uh, nickel sulfate, and um, you know op options of using uh, color, you know, food color instead, which is um, very very possible. You know, if you're doing um, AP Chem experiment one, sports drink, then you're going to be using blue food color. Uh, but experiment number two is uh, copper nitrate. Um, brass, copper and brass. And so that one, you know, will work perfectly well with uh, your, your spectrum is or with your colorimeter, in fact. Um, there was some discussion about accessing lab manuals. So I hit that. There was at least one person that was curious about the fiber where, you know, does it come with the spectrometer? I said, no, but you can buy it separately. Um, just need to be careful. Uh, if you have, a, as Melissa mentioned earlier, um, there's two, uh, versions of SpectraVis out there mostly. Um, we had an older one before SpectraVis Plus. Um, and so if you need a fiber, if you want to do some of that cool emission stuff, there's most is holding up the, the older SpectraVis Plus. We don't sell the SpectraVis Plus anymore, but we do still sell the fiber. So if you own that and you'd want to do emission spectra, then I believe it's about $69 or $70 for the fiber, and you can do emission spectra. Um, so that's something to consider. Um, it blew me away when I first got one of these devices many years ago about how much how much mileage you can get out of that spectrum. It's um, it's uh, it's a, there's a and Melissa pointed out a lot of cool things and actually hit a couple of things I hadn't even thought of. <laughs> so I will be sharing those with colleagues in the future. Uh, you relate fluorescein absorbance energy levels to fluorescein energy levels. So Melissa, you want, the question, do you see it in there from Don? Oh, uh, yes, I do. Yeah, you're better at that than me. So I'm gonna let you answer that question. Um, yeah, for that, I would I would convert. I, uh, so the question was, um, how would you relate the fluorescein absorbance energy levels to the fluorescence energy levels? Um, and I would just, I would convert your wavelengths and um, convert those to energy, take your peak wavelengths and convert those to energies and, and talk about the Stokes shift, which is the difference between the absorbance and the fluorescence um, and talk about the energy loss there. So, so using Planck's constant, you can, you can convert wavelength to energy and um, and that's where I would talk about this is that your absorbance peak. So this is how much energy it took to excite the fluorescein molecule. And then once it got that energy, it emitted light at this energy, um, uh, at this wavelength, which corresponds to this amount of energy. And where did the energy in between go? Um, and so that's how I would I would open that discussion and have students do some of those calculations. Um, that could be, you know, depending on your students, maybe you just want to talk a little bit more uh, broadly about it. But if, if you have some advanced students or you're doing some AP, I would have them do those calculations. And we, we talked about Planck for a whole class period sometimes. So, so use it. And, and, um, we talked about the photoelectric effect, like that directly relates back to the photoelectric effect, right? So you, when you talked about that, you can talk about some of these other things with, with fluorescein. The other one that blows me away is chlorophyll because it absorbs way down around 500, but it emits way up at like six something. Was it 670 or something, Melissa? And yeah. when you do it with the lights turned down in your room, the chlorophyll turns green. I'm oh, probably wrong. It turns red. Mm -hmm. And so this green stuff is looking red and so that is that shift as, as melissa mentioned that shift in wavelength to a to a higher wavelength lower energy 
right? So we're, we're exciting at a higher wavelength and we're emitting at a lower wavelength. Uh, pardon me, I said that fast backwards, didn't I? We're exciting at a higher energy and we're emitting at a lower energy, but in terms of wavelength, it's the opposite, right? We're exciting at a lower wavelength, emitting at a higher wavelength. That difference is represented by the amount of energy that's being given off by that molecule. In the case of chlorophyll, it's just dramatic how big that shift is. Mm -hmm. um, and just, I, I find that exciting and yeah you, know, you can do it with spinach leaves and ethanol right you just yep. you know yep. you can get that chlorophyll easy peasy by taking some green leaves i like spinach um ethanol isopropyl alcohol just stick it in a baggie and mush it around a little bit works great okay might have to filter out a little bit of the chunks but um it still comes out really nice um spectrum vacuum tubes are used to fraction grading would it also work with uh, yes um you can definitely, not the diffraction grading, you don't need that, that's built into the spectrum is, um, but you can definitely shoot, uh, shine the fiber at, or hold the fiber up to a uh, uh, vacuum uh, um, tubes, uh, neon, argon, you know, whatever you, whatever you have, have there. We have hydro, we sell hydrogen, neon, um, what else do we sell? Nitrogen, oxygen, I don't know, well, we have an air tube, which is kind of neat because it's a mixture of oxygen and nitrogen. Um, and you can pull the spectrum off of those uh, very nicely. Um, you could look at those tubes, of course, with a, with a uh, diffraction grading and with use your eye as the detector, but it's a little more challenging to get the wavelengths. You can pull the wavelengths right off the, um, the software. So I have an old mercury. Shh, don't tell anybody, Mary. <laughs> We had the mercury police come to my school. <laughs> I know I kept pointing up to the ceiling. You know, what about those? You're gonna take those? Um, you know, but yeah, you can definitely look at the, the fluorescent lights in your room. And if you pull down a mercury, mercury spectrum and put that um, next to it, you know, it's very very nice way to to do that. Um, the other one that that Melissa. Uh, uh, we, we talked about it, but we didn't talk too much about it was if you look at the spectrum of the incandescent bulb, you'll see a lot of infrared and um, it's way off to the right. And what's interesting is, you know, if you were back in the days of the easy bake oven, right, <laughs> you know, you had these uh, these incandescent bulbs and you can show the 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 infrared and the fact that the beauty of the software is that it it shows the background spectrum you know, the colors, but then when you look at the infrared end of the spectrum, there's no colors back there. And it's, I always point to my eyes and tell students, it's because these detectors don't see that and, you know, because it's not visible light, but it's heat. And so, you know, the old easy bake ovens and things like that. Um, so yeah, it is kind of neat to show the practical applications of <laughs> kind of in the, in the attic. Hard to use though, right? You got to find a bulb. Um, but uh, it is kind of neat to see um, the, uh, the practical applications. I mean, if you take a remote control, just one of these that has a, let me find the right camera here, that has a, uh, uh, if you have one that has a infrared light in it um, and you point that at the uh, fiber, you can actually see the, the, the light, the infrared light coming out of that. So it's kind of a neat, way to show how this invisible light part of the spectrum is very important to our lives. So, um, but yeah, it's uh, there's a lot of neat applications that are built into uh, this this device. It's, uh, yeah, we, we understand that it's a little expensive, um, but compared to some of the other, other devices out there, and as Melissa pointed out, if you do happen to have a LabQuest 2 or LabQuest 3, you can share the data off of that one device to as many students as you want through your Wi-Fi network. So uh, what, ca what cable the fiber with the optic, uh, ocean optic spec? Is that a redundant question? So the ocean optic spec, um, if, you, if it's the one I'm thinking of, that comes in two pieces. The, um, the cuvette holder is on one side and then you can detach that from the detector. Um, you can point that, if you have one of those ocean optics ones that comes apart, I think most of them do. Uh, our Vernier spectrometer is an ocean optic spectrometer. You can point that at a light at a light source, and you don't need a fiber. However, we do sell an optical fiber for that particular spectrometer. It's a little different in in configuration because it has like a little screw connector where it connects to the detector. But you don't necessarily need it. You can point the detector, just unscrew. There's two little screws that hold the cuvette holder in place. 
pull those out and detach the cuvette holder and then just point the detector at a light source and it'll work fine. Um, if it's from us, if it's one of our devices, um, it will work with our software. Um, not every ocean optic spectrometer works with our software. So just be aware of that. But if you bought it through us, then it will work with our software. Okay. Uh, did I hit all the questions? It's a copy of the chat. Um, I, I, uh, Angie, you're still there, right? Did we do anything with this chat? Do we ever keep a copy of it or anything? I'm not sure. I know the answer about it quicker. So I can definitely download a copy of the chat. And so that will be included in the follow up email uh, for everyone to reference. Excellent. Excellent. Yeah. Uh, Melissa's laptop, just as we were starting the, the workshop, folks, her, her laptop was at 50%. So I got to feel like her battery died. And that's why Melissa had to drop out. Um, she forgot to bring her power supply to the studio at the office. So, uh, but I, I think we've, we've, we've pretty much killed the hour here. So by all means, uh, if you have any questions at all, uh, you can write to chemistry at vernier.com. That comes to all three of us. Um, you can you can write to support at vernier.com. We'd love to talk to you. You're welcome to, to call us. We have a chat feature on our website. If you want to chat and it's a chemistry specific question, they'll frequently tag one of us and say, hey, can you answer that question? Um, but we're, we're here for you. So if we can help you with any of this stuff. We have a fourth webinar planned. Um, and it's up on our website. Um, it's on, on ionic and covalent bonding, and um, and so I'm going to play around with the conductivity sensor and some some activities that not only deal with ionic and covalent bonding, but how do you compare different ionic compounds to one another? Um, a little slightly advanced topic, but I'll mention it during the workshop. We'll talk about the Van Hoff factor and how that that fa that factors in. Sorry, bad pun um, into um, the discussion, but so that's coming down the pike. Uh, it's the last of our fall um, uh, web chemistry webinars, and that should be in two or three weeks. Um, so if you're interested, please, uh, uh, we'd love to see you, and um, we'll show you some activities that you might use with your students um, to te teach that topic. Otherwise, I think we've killed the hour, and um, so. Thanks for thanks for coming and um, look for the uh, information on the recording and don't forget you got that whole folder of stuff that you're welcome to use anywhere that works for you. Have a great day.